Hello everyone and welcome to the introduction to medicine event. Uh, sorry for the slight delay, we've been getting some technical issues sorted out. Uh, so my name is Jamie, I'm a junior doctor that works uh, in Fife just now and does some volunteer work with uh, You Can Be A Doctor. Today you'll be hearing from a variety of different doctors of different levels and from medical students about different aspects of what it's like to be doing medicine and to be um, to be a doctor. Uh, the way that this will be formatted is there will be a recorded talk first from each of our speakers and then after the talk you will be given the opportunity to ask questions to the speaker live. If you have questions to ask we would encourage you to ask them as we go. Um, and the ways that you can do this are either in the chat itself, you can tweet at you can be a doctor, or you can send an email to advice at you can be a doctor.co.uk. Uh, our first speaker is going to be a medical student talking about what it's like to be a medical student at university. Uh, her name is Lauren, and she is currently studying at Glasgow. So we will put you on to her talk just now. And as I say, ask any questions and then at the end, she'll answer them in person. Hi everyone, my name's Lauren and I'm a medical student at Glasgow University. I'm currently doing my intercalated degree and I'm going to speak to you today about what it's like to be a medical student. So most university courses are only four years long, but medical school is either five or six years long, depending on whether or not you want to do an intercalated degree. Most medical schools are sp split their curriculum into two parts. So you have the preclinical years, which is usually years one and two, or sometimes might include year three as well. And then you have the clinical years, which is the senior years. And in your preclinical years, you'll spend most of your time learning about how the body works normally. And then in the clinical years, you start to learn about what happens when the body goes wrong and you start thinking more about disease. So in Glasgow, we spend our first two years actually at university on campus and we'll learn about a variety of different things. So we learn about anatomy, which is the study of the normal structure of the body. And we learn about physiology, which is the study of how the body works normally. And we do that through lectures and we also do them through labs. So lectures will be somewhat similar to what you might be used to in school. But where in school you might have one teacher teaching a class of 20 to 30 people. When you go into a lecture, you'll have one lecturer speaking to maybe 300 people. So it's not quite as interactive as uh, classroom learning in school might be. And then labs, we do a lot of labs for anatomy. Um, so usually in an anatomy lab, we'll go in and there'll be a cadaver, which is a dead body. And we'll have to dissect it and we'll have a particular structure that we need to look at that week and in our groups we'll have to do the, the dissection and make notes and things like that. Um, we also have a lot of small group work in Glasgow. So we have something called PBL, which stands for problem-based learning. And in PBL, you'll have a small group of maybe about 10 students and we'll all come together and we'll have a particular topic that we have to cover that week. So say, for instance, we might be talking about the heart and we'll need to talk about the structure of the heart, how the heart works normally and um, 
all those sort of things and we'll come together and we'll discuss the topic as a group. We'll have a chance to compare notes, to ask each other questions about things that we were a bit unsure about. We also have something called vocational skills, VS, uh, and that's where we learn about ethics and we also learn about communication skills. So that's quite good fun. We usually have uh, actors come in and they pretend to be patients and we do pretend consultations with them. And in first and second year, we kind of just do straightforward consultations. And then in third year, they become a bit more difficult and we maybe have to discuss something that's quite embarrassing or we have to break bad news to them. So it's quite useful to be able to practice that with an actor. Uh, and it's quite a fun class to go to as well. So I think that's one of the things that I've really liked about medicine and I really liked about the first few years in particular is that it's not just academic stuff. There's lots of practical stuff as well that you get to do, which can be quite challenging, but also makes the course a bit more fun. Um, then you move on to your clinical years and you spend most of your time then on placement. So you'll be shadowing doctors, you might spend time on the wards, doing ward rounds, uh, speaking to patients there. You might spend time in clinic, you'll spend time uh, in theatre watching operations, you'll spend time out at GP practices as well and you'll rotate round different medical specialties. So placement is quite good fun because you're finally getting to do what you've trained to do and get to work with patients. You get to work on your scientific knowledge of all the different diseases you need to know about, but you also have to do practical things like uh, various clinical skills, like taking blood or measuring blood pressure. Um, and again, you have a chance to work on your communication skills as well as you uh, work with all the different patients that you'll see uh, in the hospital as you go through all of your placements. Uh, I mentioned at the start that I'm doing an intercalated degree and what that is is just a year out of the core medicine course uh, and it's more focused on the research side of things and you get a chance to do your own research project which is quite cool. So I said at the beginning as well that being a medical student is a little bit different from being any other kind of student. So the workload that we have is a bit more intense, especially at the beginning. I think the difference between how much work you have to do and how much work your friends on other courses have to do is probably most obvious then. That being said, there is still a lot of time to do things out with medicine. So when you go to uni, there are so many different medical school. When you go to uni, there are so many different student societies and sports clubs. So there's plenty of opportunities to keep up with old hobbies that you've done before uh, and opportunities to try out new things that you've never done. So, for example, I'm part of the trampolining club at uni, which is quite good fun and something I hadn't really done before I came to university. One of the things that I really like about medicine is that because it is a little bit different from other courses, it kind of feels like being a part of a big family and everyone's really close. There are loads of different medical student societies, some of which are educational societies and some of them are more social. Um, we have loads and loads of different social events. So one of the big events at the start of the year is Medic Families, where all of the new first years will be paired up with a parent and maybe even a grandparent from older years. Um, there's also a ball every year for everyone in the medical school. There's a ball for when you get halfway through the course in third year and a ball when you graduate at the end of fifth year. When the fifth years finish their final exams, usually towards the end of March, we all go out on a pub crawl, like all 500 of us, uh, and we wear our scrubs. Um, and that's always quite good fun. And there are loads of other social events throughout the year as well. And I think generally medical students are all quite close to one another. And it's one of the really nice things about the course. One of the things I was asked to speak about was some advice for people who were maybe a bit worried about money when they came to university. So the first thing I would say is apply to Scottish medical schools because then the Scottish government will pay for your tuition fees and you don't need to worry about that. 
There are five medical schools in Scotland and you're allowed to apply for, th for four of them. Um, you can also get student loans from SAS. Most people will get loans from them. The standard loan at the moment is about £475 a month. But depending on how much your parents earn, you might be eligible to get more than that. Some of that extra money will be a loan, which you have to pay back, and some of it will be a bursary that you don't have to pay back. Each of the individual universities will also have various scholarships and bursaries available for students. Uh, often the criteria to be eligible for the various ones are quite specific, but if you have a look, you will probably find one that you can apply for. Um, you'll find information about that on the financial services page of each university and you'll be able to find contact details there um, for people who can give you more specific advice. And usually your school guidance teacher should be able to help you with finding uh, bursaries and scholarships. I would say there's a lot of funds available, but sometimes accessing them can be a little bit tricky. There are lots of forms to be filled in and it's not a completely straightforward process, but there is help available if you need it. Uh, some of you will also have to work part-time jobs whilst you're at uni. There are loads and loads of people who do that and manage to do it absolutely fine. It is trickier having to balance uni and a job and having a life outside of that, but it is manageable. Um, it's a lot easier to do in younger years, um, but you can still do it even in older years. I know people who do that. Uh, personally, I've been lucky in that I don't have to work during term time as long as I work full time over the summer. And that's worked out fine for me just now. In younger years, you get quite long summer holidays. So there's lots of time to work and earn money. But your holidays do get shorter in later years. So that's something that's, I think, going to be a bit trickier. But it is absolutely manageable to have a job and still do uh, all of your uni work and have a life. So for those of you who are interested in studying medicine, uh, there's... I have some advice for what you can do now to start preparing for your applications. So I think it's really important to think about uh, transferable skills that make a good medical student or a good doctor. So that would be things like the ability to work in a team, to be a good leader, good communication skills, being empathetic, being able to manage your time well. All of these things are really important. So have a think about them. Think about what ones of those skills you maybe don't do so well and how you could try and get a bit better at them. Think about all the extracurricular activities you do uh, and how you could get better at those skills through that. Um, all of the medical schools do expect you to have some form of work experience before you apply. And usually that would be clinical work experience, but that hasn't really been happening at the moment. Um, but it will get back to normal and start happening again at some point. But for you guys, clinical work experience where you actually go and shadow a doctor, like at a GP practice or in hospital, you can't do that until you're 16. So in the meantime, you can get volunteering experience in like a caring environment. So it might be like in a care home, you could go in, volunteer and visit some of the residents there who don't normally get many visits. That's quite a common thing for people to do. Uh, I volunteered at the Macmillan Centre near where I live and I worked on the reception there and I would just sort of chat to people as they came in. If people were new to the centre, I'd show them where to go. Um, and that was a really good experience just to get used to the caring environment. Any volunteering work like that is really valuable. So obviously at the moment, you'll probably find it quite tricky to get volunteering experience and that's OK. But once things start to get back to normal, that's something you can think about trying to do. So hopefully you find that interesting and helpful. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about what medical school is like. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so as you've heard, my name's Lauren and I'm a 
student at Glasgow University. Um, and I've been seeing some of the questions that you guys have been sending in, so I'll answer them for you just now. Uh, so quite a few of you were asking about um, the intercalated degree that I said I'm currently doing. So that is really just an extra year that you do in some universities like St Andrews and Edinburgh. Um, you have to do it in other universities uh, like Glasgow. You can choose uh, to do it or not to do it. And it's kind of it's a year where you spend more of your time focusing on sort of the basic science elements of medicine and the sort of research. Uh, aspects um, and I'm currently doing my intercalated degree in critical care which has been obviously very interesting this year given everything that's going on so it's a good chance to sort of learn extra information about um, a specific topic that you're really interested in it's a chance to sort of um, get an introduction into research sort of what it's all about how it's carried out you get to do your own research project as well and sometimes as a result of that project you might get to present your research at conferences or get it published and um, so it's a really good insight into sort of the research aspects of medicine that you might decide you want to do a bit more of later on in your career um, and that's really why I decided to do Intercal and um, to see whether that was something that I would enjoy doing. And I've really liked doing that this year. Um, but as I say, it's not compulsory at Glasgow. So if you decided that you have absolutely no interest in research, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Um, someone else has asked sort of what's been like during COVID. Um, and I think it's definitely been very weird. I'm sure everyone has had a very strange year. Um, for me, doing my intercalated degree, mostly what we do is sort of lectures and tutorials and stuff. So we've just been doing that over Zoom. Uh, so I've been at home uh, for the whole of this year, um, just doing lectures over Zoom, which has definitely been very, very weird. Um, not the same as usual, but I'm sure everyone's sort of had the same experience um, I sort of I spoke in the video about sort of how in medicine it's really nice because there's a, a big social aspect to the degree and that's something that obviously we haven't really had this year and um, which has definitely made this year a lot harder but again that's not something that's unique to medicine everyone sort of felt that this year and um, I know some of my friends who didn't do intercal and have gone on to fourth year instead they've still been able to go on placement. So they've been on placement since August and things have been sort of a little bit different, obviously, because there's, uh, because of everything that's going on in the hospital, but mostly their placements are sort of carrying on as normal and they've been able to see patients and sort of learn, um, learn in the hospitals as they normally would. Um, <clears throat> someone was asking, if we have free time to do things outside of uni, and we absolutely do, um, you definitely have more free time in sort of first and second year than you do in the later years. Um, but you do have time to sort of pursue other interests. So one of the things I do is I joined the trampolining club. So we do, we train twice a week and that's quite good fun. Uh, there are loads and loads of different like student societies and sports clubs and things that you can join. Some of them are very competitive, some of them aren't. Um, so there will be lots of stuff that you can do. You can choose to keep doing extracurriculars, sort of activities that you do now. You can pick up new things that you've maybe never even heard of before and you do have time to do that. Um, you do have to be quite good at managing your time. Um, uni is a bit different from school in that sort of no one's sort of telling you or oh, you have to get this bit of homework done or whatever. It's sort of it's up to you to stay on top of your learning. So, you know, you have to make sure that you're getting all your notes done and everything. And you're also like putting time aside to do fun things that you enjoy. And it's sort of up to you to manage your time. But it is um, definitely something you can do. And quite a lot of people manage to have part time jobs and things like that whilst they're at uni. So definitely manageable. Um, there's a question about how to cope with going from high school to university. 
And I think that's something that can be quite difficult uh, in medicine in particular. Just I think what's difficult about medicine isn't really the concepts. It's like none of the concepts you learn are any more difficult than things that you'll cover like in higher or advanced hires that you do in school. It's just that there's so much of it. So learning to sort of, you have to learn at such a pace when you come to medical school and that is hard to adapt to at first, but you do you do adapt it and you find ways to, to make sure that you're covering all the material. Um, and sort of by the end of first year, you are sort of amazed at how much you've managed to do in such a short period of time. Um, one of the most important things is just to make new friends and to speak to them, to sort of create a little support network round about you. Um, going from school to university is quite hard because um, I know when I went to Glasgow, I didn't know anyone at all. And that was kind of scary, but it's also a nice opportunity to meet lots of new people. Um, the first few months can be a little bit hard because it just takes a little bit of time to establish friendships, but you just have to sort of keep going. You'll meet lots of different people. You'll have lots of opportunities to try new things and you will make lots of wonderful friends. Um, and I think that's not really something that's specific to medicine. Um, that's just uh, what it's like doing any uni course. Um, so yeah, that's really, I think that was most of the questions that you guys sent in. So hopefully that's been helpful. And if you have any more questions, just put them in the chat and I'll answer them for you as well. Um, Thank you very much, Lauren, for that. Um, hopefully that's answered some of your questions about the process of medical school. The next person we're going to be hearing from is a junior doctor named Paula, who is working in Newcastle. And she's going to be talking about what it's like starting life working in a hospital and being a junior doctor. So we're going to hear her talk now. So hi everybody, my name's Paula and I am a doctor working down in Newcastle. Um, I've just finished my night shifts, so I'm recording this after I've done three of them. Um, currently it's about 10 o'clock in the morning and I've just got home after doing my last night shift. Um, what we thought might be interesting for you guys is for me to take you along on some of my night shifts over the weekend. So I'm currently a medical trainee um, and I'm working towards becoming a medical consultant. I'm not sure what I want to do yet, but I possibly want to look after older people doing geriatrics or maybe look after people who are approaching the end of their life, um, so doing palliative care. But I don't know yet. So when you're a junior trainee, you just rotate through all sorts of different stuff. So my night shift this weekend is going to be on the assessment suite, which is basically the unit where people come after they have been seen in A&E or after they have been seen by a GP or 111 and they think that they need to come into hospital, but they're not super, super unwell. If they're super unwell, they need to go straight to a &E. um, So it's interesting, get to see lots of different things, get to meet lots of lovely and interesting patients, get to work with a really good team. Uh, so I'll try and show you some of the interesting cases that I see through the nights uh, and hopefully it'll be exciting for you. If you've got any questions for me, uh, keep, them, keep them in your mind and we'll hopefully be able to answer them when we do our Q&A session at the end of the event. Okay, see you on my night shift. So I've just pulled up outside the hospital. It's half past eight. Um, we start our handover process at nine. So I'm just going to go in, get changed into my scrubs and get a coffee before I head to handover um, to find out what's been happening in, on the suite during the day, what jobs I need to do through the evening and if there's any patients that I need to know about who are particularly unwell. Um, so I'm just going to go and get ready. So I'm just heading in now. As you can see, the ambulances are there, which is always actually a good sign because it means that they're not out at an emergency. So hopefully we'll not have a hugely busy night tonight, but we'll just have to wait and see. It is Saturday, so oh, there we go. So that's me all changed and ready. I've got everything that I need. I've got my stethoscope. I've got my badge that lets me in everywhere. Um, I've got my scrubs on and I'm just going to head round to the assessment suite and find out what's been happening during the day. Room where we have our handover. Normally what we'll do is we'll put the list of patients up on the screen so that people can see them. 
and then we'll all have a paper copy of a list which looks a bit like that one that you can see in the distance where we'll all write down the information that we need to know about whether there's any jobs that we need to do. Um, at the minute there's no one else here so I'm going to take my mask off and have a sip of my coffee while I'm waiting for everyone else to come in for a night. So that, this, is, this is our night team who are all working very hard. <laughs> so everyone is working very hard on yeah. their computers. So we are the team for tonight. So Sophie's the registrar and then we've got Carol who's one of our IMT2s. Then Alex is an F1. He's not waving. And then Jessie's one of our <laughs> F4s. So yes, this is the team. I've just seen my first patient of the night. So it's a lady who has come in with a headache. Um, she's an elderly lady who's got a bit of confusion, so it's quite difficult to actually find out specifically what's been happening with the headache. Um, so she's been seen through the a &E department. She's had a scan of her head, which hasn't showed any problems, but has showed that she's got a bit of sinus or pacification, which is basically like this little part of your head here. I'm doing my video. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, Basically, we're going to treat her for sinusitis. She's going to get some painkillers, she's going to get some decongestant medication and then we're going to see how she's doing in the morning and hopefully we'll try and get her home as long as she's feeling well enough. We're just having a break to go and get a can of juice and then look at this. We've got Christmas decorations. Yay! It's about five in the morning so we're all a bit tired but we're okay. <laughs> so it's seven in the morning, I've just seen a patient who had Covid three weeks ago and has come in with some chest pain and difficulty breathing and we know Covid puts you at increased risk of blood clots so he's had a blood test called a D-dimer which looks to see whether or not you're at increased risk of having a blood clot and it's come back high so this chap is going to need to have a scan of his chest to look at the blood vessels to see whether or not there's any blood clots in there. Um, so I'm going to need to put a cannula in. I'm just going to take you through what's in a cannula pack if I can flip this camera around. Oh! So these are the cannula packs that we have that are made up all ready to go. So we'll just have a look and tell you what, show you what's in it. Ooh. Shake it all out. Oh dear. Um, so we've got this little bag which we can, I tend to chuck to the side because I don't really need it. Uh, you've got your cannula dressing. So cannula is basically a little tube that goes into your vein and the reason we need it for this patient is because he's going to need to have some dye injected in order to have the CT scan. So this is a cannula. It's basically a little plastic tube on the end of a needle. So we insert the needle into the vein and then we push the plastic tube off into the vein, take the needle out and then stick it all down. So we've got the cannula, we've got the dressing, we've got a tourniquet which we use to push up your blood vessels so it's easier to put the cannula in. We've got this little thing which is called an octopus, which is basically what we put on the end of the cannula so that we can put things through it. And this is a little cleaning swab that we're going to clean the skin with before we do the procedure. And then this is just some swabs just in case there's any mess. We're also going to need this, which is a flush. So it's basically some salty water and we're going to push that through the cannula after we've put that in in order to see whether or not it's worked. So we've got the results back from that gentleman's test that we talked about earlier on to look for blood clots in his chest. And it's come back positive, so it shows that he does have blood clots. Um, and we've diagnosed him with something called a pulmonary embolus. Embolus basically just means that something has moved from somewhere to somewhere else. Uh, and in this case, it's a blood clot, which is moved most often from your leg because all the blood pools down there and clots all the way up to your chest and it causes the symptoms that we talked about, the chest pain, the breathlessness. Um, so all that's been explained to this chap. Um, what's going to need to happen now is that we'll need to look for reasons why he might have had a blood clot. Often there's no reason that we find, um, but we need to look for things in people who are in their 50s, 60s that can cause them. And often things like underlying cancers can be the concern. Um, so this chap's going to have a few investigations such as further CT scans, um, urine tests and um, more blood tests to look and see whether or not there's any evidence of him having an underlying cancer somewhere. Um, the other thing that can cause blood clots is COVID. Uh, it's changed how we look at blood clots in the lungs especially because patients are really susceptible to getting blood clots. We're not 100% sure why, but they definitely are. So it may well be that his COVID infection is the thing that's actually caused him to have the blood clot on his lung. Um, so from now on what we're going to do is um, give him some medication to thin his blood. Um, so it's a drug called Rivaroxaban which is basically um, 
a drug that interferes with how your blood clots and makes your blood more thin than it normally would be. So they're on that um, for three months if you're not sure why the blood clot has happened, after which they'll be seen in clinic by one of the consultants who will decide whether or not they think that they're at risk of having another blood clot, in which case they might need to continue on this for a longer period. And some patients actually end up being on these medications lifelong. We'll have a look at his chest x-ray. I'll just get it up on the system. So this is a chest x-ray for the gentleman that we talked about. Um, it's a bit hard because you might not know what a normal chest x-ray looks like, but I'll try and point out the bits that look a bit funny for you. So what you can see on here is, this is his trachea, which is basically the windpipe that goes down into the lungs. And these are his lung fields here. And dark is air. So we like dark, dark is good. These are the ribs, which I'm sure you probably know. This is the diaphragm, which helps you breathe. These are just little loops of bowel. And we often see these on chest x-rays. They tend to not mean anything, as long as the patient doesn't have any symptoms. And what we want to do is when we're looking at an x-ray simply is look for things which stand out slightly. So in this gentleman, you probably might not be able to see it on this x-ray as clearly because you're not looking at it on a screen. But this is all nice and black. This is all nice and black. You can see some funny little line markings on this one. But on this side, things look a bit different. So can you see this little patch of white here? That's not normally there. These little patches of white, they're not normally there either. And this little patch here, also a bit funny. And then he's got some, normally your heart border is nice and smooth. And his heart border is a bit wonky. So we call, when you see white on a chest x-ray, we call this consolidation. It basically just means that there's some stuff in the lungs which shouldn't be there. And it's white because you're not managing to get air into those areas of the lungs. So this x-ray can be described as a consolidation in the left lower zone of the lung, because this is your left side and this is your right side. Things flip on a chest x-ray. So that could be lots of different things, but you need to look at it in the context of what he has come in with. And my worry with this chest x-ray was because these looked so marked off that he'd possibly had a blood clot, which had caused part of his lungs to not have a blood supply to them and then caused them to basically die off slightly. So that's what we call a pulmonary infarct. Um, so it's basically when you don't get blood supply to things and then it dies off slightly. So those are what I was worried about with these. It also looks, in a non-specific term, a bit COVID-y. So COVID changes on a chest x-ray tend to be on the outside. So a pneumonia could be anywhere. It could be there, it could be there, it could be there, but it tends to be in one region. COVID changes tend to be on the outside. And we know this guy's had COVID, so these might be changes which have come from COVID. So it could be a couple of things, but what I think that he needed was a more detailed scan of his chest, a CT scan, which can look at the blood vessels to make sure that there's blood flowing into his lungs, um, just to make sure there weren't any blood clots there because missing a blood clot is not something that we want to do because it's something that we can easily treat, especially in quite a young patient. So it's about half seven in the morning. Um, I thought I'd just show you guys what an ECG looks like because you have probably seen little heart tracing complexes in places before, but probably not seen an actual ECG. So it's a bit complicated. I won't overcomplicate things. Um, basically, these little complexes here just show when your heart's beating. And we use this paper to kind of calculate how fast or how slow the heart's going. Um, so we'll compare two different ones. Oh, I've, oh God, I've got patient information on that. So, so Sophie's doing the most important task of the night, which is choosing the meme that we're going to put onto our handover list in the morning. It has to be funny and relate to the fact that we're on night shift. So we've had a bit of a cat theme going on this week, but we seem to be diverting from the cat theme and going straight to night shift meme. Have you got a favourite one, Sophie? I don't know. This does, this is relevant. Yeah. But it's not that funny. Mm. I like awesome. this one. 
Yes. <laughs> Bait shift is pretty, pretty easy. Yes. <laughs> Bait shift is not easy, but it's okay. Um, so we're just going to pick a meme. Clearly, having a very busy night. Hello everyone, um, it's Paula from Nights, who you've just seen there two minutes ago. Um, I hope that you enjoyed that video and that it was useful for you all. Um, I'm just here to answer any questions that you've got. I can see that you've got lots of really interesting questions on the chat, so I'm just going to try and work through those um, and see if I can answer some questions for you. So let me just have a look and I'll decide what I'm going to answer first. I think one of the really good questions that was asked was, um, What's the best thing about being a doctor? It's a bit of a difficult question because there's lots of really good things about being a doctor and lots of really challenging things too. Um, one of the best things about being a doctor, um, I find, is that you get to meet lots of really interesting people as your patients. Um, right now I'm working on the transplant ward at the Freeman Hospital. Um, so we're one of the five heart-lung transplant centres in the UK. Um, so I'm working with my patients for a very long time because they stay with us on the ward for several months. So I get to know them very well, which is great and really, really um, one of the best parts of the job. Um, but also can be quite challenging when bad things happen to your patients as they do sometimes in medicine. If they become unwell, um, it can be quite difficult when you've built up a good relationship with a patient. So it's definitely one of the best things is getting to know and meet and uh, lots and lots of really interesting people, um, but also it can be one of the tough parts of it too. So that was a really good question. Um, let's have a look and see what other questions we've got. Um, I think someone asked what the most interesting case I'd seen was, um, and it was actually quite recently, it was just a couple of months ago. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the film Brain on Fire. Um, it's also a book. It was basically written by a girl who developed a condition called autoimmune encephalitis, which is a very long word, which basically just means that your brain tissue is becoming inflamed. So itis is the medical term for anything becoming inflamed. So I saw a lady um, who had been completely fit and well, no problems at all, who had developed um, a like, very, very sudden onset of abnormal behaviour. Um, and then started to have seizures. And we referred her to the neurology team when she came into hospital um, because we weren't really quite sure what was going on. Um, and they did something called a lumbar puncture, which is basically, you might have seen those on TV. It's when we stick an, a little needle into the spine to get a sample of the spinal fluid. And that can tell us whether or not there's inflammation or infections going on within the spinal fluid which lines the brain so it can tell us if there's any problems with the brain or any problems with the spinal cord and this lady had autoimmune encephalitis which is very very rare um, and she was given steroids and some other medications to try and help that uh, and she got much better and managed to get home so that's probably it's quite recent but it's one of the most interesting cases that I've seen for sure it was it was fascinating um, well, the man with blood clots be all right yes um so he was a lovely chap um and what what the good thing about the online systems at the moment when being a doctor is that you can um keep in touch and follow up with your patients uh, and he's doing well um on the blood thinning medication patients with blood clots tend to do well um so he'll be reviewed in clinic in about three months time to see whether or not um how he's doing how he's getting on and whether he needs to continue on the blood thinning medication for um any longer um, let's have a look. Um, what is the difference in working in a hospital with COVID? Um, it was very different from before. I think the closest we'd came to working in a hospital with COVID was flu season, which I'd experienced um, in my first couple of years as a doctor. So I've been working for four years now. Uh, and when flu season would come, you would get a wave of patients who would come in and you would have loads and loads of flu positive patients. And you'd have to be very careful when you were going in to see patients who had any chesty symptoms because you didn't want to go in without wearing anything and give flu to someone else. Um, COVID is like that times a million. Um, you saw lots of very, very unwell patients with very, very bad chests. Um, so it was quite difficult. Um, lots of people who were younger um, not doing too well, which is something that 
you don't tend to see very often. So it's been it's been tough. I think it's been tough for all of us. I think all of us who work in the You Can Be Adopted team have have worked with patients with COVID, and it has been has been quite challenging. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom because you get to see patients um, recovering from COVID, doing well, and getting home. Um, that can be a really positive thing. And we've got the vaccine coming now, which uh, is a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. I saw someone ask if I've got the vaccine. Uh, no, I've not had the vaccine, um, but I have um, had COVID back in March. So uh, hopefully my immune system's done its job and I am immune, but I'm not 100% sure. So I will be getting uh, the vaccine when it comes out and I would recommend that all of you guys get it to recommend it to your family members as well because the best way for us all to get rid of COVID is for as many of us to get vaccinated as possible. Um, someone asked, have I ever performed surgery? Um, yes, surprisingly, mm -hmm. because I, oh sorry, something just popped up on my phone. Um, I don't want to be a surgeon. I am a medical trainee. Um, I think I possibly want to um, look after older people, like I said, doing geriatrics or look after people at the end of their lives in palliative care. But the great thing about being a junior doctor is that they let you rotate through lots and lots of different specialties to see whether or not there's something that you might have not done yet that you end up liking. Uh, so I did surgery twice. I did it when I was in my first year of being a foundation doctor and then I did it in my second year of being a foundation doctor. Uh, and the second year was quite different. They gave you a lot more responsibility. And I was in theatre with the consultants probably about two to three times a week. Um, so I got to help with appendix operations, getting to take people's appendixes out. I got to help with taking people's gallbladders out. Um, and it was it was good. It was it was interesting. It wasn't it wasn't for me. I'm not a very practical person. Um, but it, it it's for many people. And I've got lots of um, friends um, who trained to be surgeons, girls as well. So you don't need to be a boy to be a surgeon. That's an absolute fake news. Girls can be surgeons too. And there's lots of really good female surgeons um, around. So don't rule that out if you think that you want to be a surgeon. Um, let me have a look and see. Is physics needed to become an eye surgeon? Um, so my friend is an eye surgeon. Uh, we did university together when we were in, in Edinburgh. So um, you just like just, that shouldn't change your choices of um, of hires and advanced hires. It would probably be useful because then when you go on to do your exams for ophthalmology, which is the specialty for being an eye surgeon, there's quite a lot of physics involved. So having that those basics would probably be quite useful for you. Um, but it's not an absolute requirement to get into medicine, but it probably would be useful. Um, I'm just having a look to see um, what else. Uh, did you have to work with cadavers um, when I was studying at university? Um, yes, you do. Uh, I went to Edinburgh University and we did prosection, um, which is basically the cadavers have already been dissected, which is cut up into specific slices to show you the different parts of the anatomy. Um, by the anatomy professors and specialists at the university. Uh, dissection is when you actually do the cutting up of the body yourself to look to see where the different structures are. That's offered at um, Dundee University, I think, and I think Glasgow, but Lauren might be able to correct me about that. Um, it is a bit hard initially it's when you do it when you i still remember first going in it's a very very tough experience but they're treated with a lot of respect um and you have to remember that it's difficult to donate your body um to university for medical science so the people who've done this have gone through a lot to try and make sure that they um contribute to your learning um and everyone treats um the cadavers with the utmost respect um so it was it was something that you you got used to it and it was very very useful for learning um a very good learning experience um, and just had to appreciate the people that had um, thought to donate their bodies to the university. Um, was I ever squeamish at the sight of blood? Uh, not particularly but I do remember when I did my work experience when I was in fifth year of high school, I was probably about 16, um, I was on the ward at the Western General in Glasgow which has been demolished now, that's how old I am, um, and they uh, were going to put an acidic drain into a patient. It's basically an acidic drain is when a patient's got lots of fluid on their tummy, you can stick a needle into their tummy to try and remove some of the fluid uh, and it can make them feel a bit more comfortable. Um, but the thought of that just made me feel so unwell and my knees went a bit weak and I, I thought at that moment, am I going to be a doctor? Do I have it in me? Um, but uh, they didn't get the acidic drain at the end, so I didn't have to watch it. Um, and I just sort of thought to myself, nope, it's probably just the thought, the fact that I've never seen this before. I'm sure that if I just see it and manage to take it out of my mind, I'll be okay. And I've not had any problems with um, 
procedure since if you really are really really squeamish at the sight of blood and faint um it might be something that you have to really think about because we do bloods on patients every day um so you will be seeing blood every day it's not going to be sprayed all over the walls or anything but it will be in a little tube most of the time um so you, if, if you think that it's going to be a problem for you maybe something to think about but just because you've not it might be worth doing some work experience which i know is challenging at the moment um but we are going to try and offer some virtual work experience which we might try and um help with some of those problems uh okay um i think that's me finished with my time now you're probably all sick of hearing my voice but um it was lovely to speak to you all um and if you've got any more questions then um please just put them onto the chat um and i'll see you all later thanks for that paula we're going to be taking a short break now before the next talks and after the break we will be hearing a bit about what it's like to work as a gp what it's like to work as a consultant in hospital medicine and also a little bit about the application process and getting into medicine. Um, in the meantime, during this short break, we've got a quiz that you can do. We'll just put a link up to the quiz. Um, it's all a bit of fun, but whoever answers the most questions correctly and quickest will be the winner. So um, hopefully that's just a bit of fun to, to break up the talks a little bit. Uh, and we'll be back shortly to do the rest of the talks. Hello again, everyone. Uh, I hope that was a bit of fun, that quiz, and that maybe you learned some things. Uh, we're sorry about the difficulties we're having with chat just now in terms of messages being deleted. Unfortunately, it's something we don't really have control over, and we're trying to get that sorted behind the scenes. In the meantime, I'd remind you all that you're also able to ask us questions by either tweeting, you can be a doctor, at you can be a doctor. Um, or by emailing advice at you can be a doctor.co.uk and we'll answer questions from that as well. Our next talk is by Jude, who is a GP who works through in Glasgow, and she's going to be talking about life working in the community. So we're going to cut to her video now. Hi, my name is Dr. Jude Marshall and I'm a GP in Glasgow. I've been asked to speak to you for a short time this evening about how and why I became a GP, how to become a GP and what a GP does, and a little bit about COVID and how that's affected what we've done. So I thought, first of all, I would introduce myself and tell you a little bit about me. So this is a funny picture, isn't it? I was probably one of those really annoying people that even as a child at this age was saying that I wanted to be a doctor. I don't know where it came from. Um, this is a picture of myself and my sister. My sister's son is actually listening tonight. Um, when we were young, we were always playing doctors and nurses, um, taking turns being each. And honestly, I don't know where it came from, but from that point, I always wanted to care for people and look after people. I'm not sure my sibling would, siblings would agree, but um, I think I was quite a caring person when I was younger. So I'm not from a medical background um, at all, actually. My family all do lots of different jobs. My parents weren't in medicine. My siblings all do very different jobs, different careers, and are all very good at what they do, but they're not in medicine or even sciences. And when I was at school, I did quite well, actually, academically, but I had to work really hard to get that. Um, but in my fifth year, when we were doing our hires, I lost my focus. So I was already volunteering at Marie Curie Hospice in Glasgow because we had to put down evidence of what we'd learned about being a doctor or working in, in medicine 
on our forms for the application, so I was already going every other Sunday and volunteering at the Marie Curie Hospice in Glasgow. And I really loved it and it just convinced me even more that that's what I wanted to do. And I thought I was really just waiting to get the offer to go to university. However, I didn't do well in my hires at all. Uh, and in that moment of opening the envelope, so yes, we used to get our results by envelope, that's how old I am, I felt that my future was crashing down. Oops. It didn't crash down though, do you know? And I guess I'm telling you this um, so that you know if things don't go straight forward the whole way through our lives, it's okay. We learn from the things that don't go well as well. I got some really good advice and I applied to a different university. I went to St Andrews and I did a degree in human science. So yeah, it was my first experience of failure, um, but I wouldn't change it now for the world. I met really good friends. I had amazing experiences that I wouldn't have had if I'd gone direct to do medicine um, as I'd wanted to. And I'm a big believer in what's for you won't go by you. So after St Andrews, I was delighted to get back into Glasgow University because I came from Glasgow. And I started medicine a long, long time ago in 1999, well before any of you were born. I loved medical school and I actually loved all the different subjects that we did. And that's when I started to think that I could be a GP because we got to learn about all the different systems. I was really lucky and I got to travel a lot during my holidays. Um, in my day, we had two electives at medical school and I was lucky enough to go to Canada. So that's a place on the left, Vancouver, or North Vancouver, and Australia. And I worked in an emergency department and in general practice, both of which were great and gave me great experiences. And once I left university, like everybody else, you complete two years as a foundation doctor. So this is general training, doing lots of different jobs in different hospitals, different specialties, just to see what um, we enjoy and to give us experience of lots of different um, parts of medicine. So how did I do my training? Um, again, back in my day, which is a long time ago, we were able to make up our own training um, pack. So I did a mixture of jobs. I did accident and emergency. So involved in managing people who were very unwell, people who'd been in trauma like road accidents or bumps and bruises and broken bones. I did care of the elderly. So traditionally looking after older people over 65 really. Obstetrics and gynaecology, where one of my first days was spent delivering triplets, which was really exciting. I did paediatrics where I worked in a community setting, looking after children with additional needs with their learning and their physical health. I also did dermatology, so looking after people's skin. I learned so much, met so many great people. Once you've completed your training, you then go in to a general practice um, for 18 months and you kind of learn the art of being a GP and how it works. You practice by doing lots of appointments, meeting people, meeting those who work in the community and generally learning all the different parts that make up general practice. This picture is a picture of myself and one of the other GPs in our practice with our most recent trainees. So what is a GP? Well, um, we're doctors who are experts in being generalists. We're the first port of call for a lot of people who are feeling unwell and they're concerned about it. I often say I know a bit about many things. I hope I know when a patient is unwell and needs assessed in the hospital for further treatment. And we work really closely with the teams in the hospital. We refer on about 13% of what we see. So the other 87% we manage ourselves in the GP practice. We use our knowledge and our skills that we've picked up during our time working in the hospitals and in the GP practice. There's 5,000 GPs in Scotland and we do about 90% of the NHS contacts as a primary care team. So earlier on, I mentioned the art of general practice and I guess you're wondering what that means. Um, for me, general practice is about being that generalist, as I said, who's looking after that person as a whole 
and not looking after their injury or their illness in isolation. We really get to know our patients and we know as well that our health is influenced by lots of other things that we can't control like stress, trauma, living in a deprived area, the sense of community, employment and unemployment. And we as GPs learn to put the health complaints for that patient in the context of their life, their home life, their family, their workplace. So as I say, we really get to know people. There are lots of different people um, who make up the GP practice, and make up the team that we work as. We have practice nurses, we have healthcare assistants, we have pharmacists, physiotherapists, a practice manager, receptionists. Some other practices maybe have paramedics or mental health counsellors as well. This is our practice team on the right hand side doing yoga. We do that once a week um, with Carrie Lunan, who's the Royal College of General Practitioners chair at the moment. And we also won team of the year in 2016 in Scotland, which was great. Um, and something to be very proud of. In our practice, we work as a really big team who have lots of different skills and knowledge to help support our patients and their health and their well-being. As well as having nurses who work in our practice, we have district nurses as well. So district nurses are nurses who go out and visit patients in their homes. Our receptionists know everyone who comes in. They know everybody's little bits and bobs, the things that they enjoy, the things that they ask for, the things they need help with. We have a pharmacist who helps us with our patients and their medication. And we as GPs might not always be the right person to help somebody with a problem, but we can generally find someone who can help. So we work with people at the start of their lives and at the end of their lives and really all stages in between. We're there for the good times and we're there for the times that are more difficult for the patient. We help with their mental health, we help with their physical health. Usually people would think we look after coughs and colds, but actually more and more we're looking after people's mental health, especially during COVID when people have found it so difficult. Some problems that people come to us with are really difficult to help with, but actually providing a listening ear and having a relationship that patients can trust is really hugely important to them getting on and getting better. I consider it a privilege to be there helping others. Imagine that in a patient's hour of need that you're the person that they and their families turn to. That is such a privilege. I love that I get to know families too. Um, this will be showing my age again, but um, one of my very first patients when I started in my practice was a girl who came in on a Friday afternoon with a rapidly developing rash. She was maybe about five and I was terrified that she had leukaemia. And now, just in the last few weeks, I've done her a check with her first baby, you know, so it's lovely that you look after all the different generations. I also love the variety that my day job brings to me. For example, I can run through a recent surgery that I did. So I spoke to patients who had breathing problems, had anxiety and depression, skin rashes, back pain, a hernia, which is a wee muscle weakness, marital problems, and a low blood count. And that's just one surgery. In fact, I specialise in looking after elderly people who live in care homes, and I love this too. I'm so fond of the older generation. I also um, have a, a variety of different things that I do day to day. So I'm like a portfolio GP, but lots of other of my friends who are trained as GPs do lots of different things. Their work includes uh, This Morning GP, the author of a book on plant-based eating, a lecturer at the university, a doctor for a football team, a doctor for a rugby team, the lead GP for Glasgow, and the chief medical officer. They're all GPs. Some people work abroad in both Canada and Australia and New Zealand most commonly, one being a GP in Queenstown in a ski resort in New Zealand. So the possibilities are endless once you're a GP. You just need to get through the training. 
There are more traditional roles, of course, um, being a locum. So a locum means filling in for GPs who might be on holiday or off unwell. You move from practice to practice and you get to experience lots of different surgeries. Salaried GPs, so they work regularly in a general practice, but they don't um, have anything to do with the running of the practice usually. And a partner in a GP practice. So as well as looking after your patients, you're also involved in running the practice. You have an agreement with the health board to kind of are the overarching team who look after us. We are giving money and we employ our own staff and pay them from our income and any pay you get is based on the income that you bring in and how you run the practice and what you place value on within the practice. So as I said, I spend part of my week uh, seeing people in care homes and also doing um, appointments with patients in our practice. I'm also a GP trainer, which means that I supervise that last 18 months of training for GPs. I love this. I love getting to know new doctors, have them come in with all their enthusiasm into the surgery and give us a little bit of their knowledge and experience. I'm also the lead GP in Glasgow for something called anticipatory care planning, which is trying to increase the number of us who are talking about what matters to us and what we want to happen in the future if we become unwell. So it's really about um, people opening up and talking to their friends, their family, as well as their health, uh, health professionals who look after them. So this brings me on to COVID. So um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about this because it's so topical at the moment. Um, this is me on the left hand side and all my PPE that we need to wear when we're seeing patients now. Um, a little bit about the emojis of um, COVID that we've been using for the last nine months and also a little bit about the services that we advise patients about. So if I'm looking back at February of this year, I remember actually I was filming something for the BBC um, for an Instagram project they were doing. And I remember talking to the team who came in about COVID and how it might affect us. And at that stage, I remember that I was getting a little bit nervous about it. There was this unknown virus that was coming from Canada and not Canada, China, and traveling to Italy and Spain mainly was what we were hearing. I knew it was going to affect us, but I had no idea how it would affect us. So overnight, as numbers increased in the UK and even before the national lockdown was announced, we stopped um, seeing patients as often face to face. You were still going to school at this stage, but with the rise in the numbers, it was felt that we should stop seeing as many patients. So I would just I used to see maybe 40 patients a day doing prescriptions and visiting people at home. And then we were advised to stop this work. And yes, we did actually shut the doors. We did close the doors and we stopped people coming in and out because the risk of us catching it, our staff catching it, but also spreading it between the patients um, was really high risk. We changed on to speaking to the exact same number, if not more patients on the telephone. We do and continue to do this every day. We use video consultations, so we use a technology to be able to see our patients in their own homes and we bring patients down to the surgery to see them face to face too. And all this is done with lots of cleaning in between and wearing the PPE that I'm modelling here. I guess I'm telling you a little bit about this because it's important that you don't believe everything that you read in the newspapers. We haven't been shut. GPs aren't sitting with their feet up. Um, they said our doors were shut and yes, they were physically shut, but we were still seeing lots and lots of people and speaking to all our patients who needed us. So yeah, just take everything with a pinch of salt. I have to be honest, it's, it's a really hard and challenging job being a GP, but it's really, really, really rewarding. Um, I've used skills that I've learned along the way from being a, a science student, a medical student, a doctor, a friend, a daughter, a mum, and from the times that I've had to see the other side of the NHS too. They've made me a good listener. I'm a detective piecing bits of information that the patients tell me together to try and come up with a diagnosis and a plan. And then I examine them using my skills to kind of make a plan and best manage that patient. And you know, if I can be a doctor, you can be a doctor and you absolutely can be a GP. So 
lovely to speak to you tonight and I'll see you in a few years. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you very much for watching my video about kind of life as a GP, why I became a GP. I hope it's inspired some of you and maybe giving you some information about general practice. So really helpfully, you've been sending in some questions, so I thought I would just run through them quickly for you. So first of all, the first question was, what are the best and worst parts of your job? Well, um, there's lots of best parts, I have to say. I think I definitely am quite a caring person and I love day to day looking after people. I also think that I get a real buzz out of looking after people and it makes me feel good about myself. Um, and it's a real privilege to be looking after people and caring for them and their families and they're out of need often. Um, worst parts, probably the long hours, probably um, the paperwork, which you'll hear in lots of professions as well. I suppose as well, we would hope um, that by the time that you're all becoming doctors, that the IT systems will maybe work a wee bit better because at the moment they don't all link up and it could be a lot better if they all linked up. Um, but they're all quite small fry things, aren't they? Generally, it's a great job. It's a really, really good job. Um, and it's good because your career can last up to, you know, 40 years. So you really want to be doing something that you love. Next question, what work experience would you need in order to work in medicine? So, or to apply for medicine, I guess you mean? I think it's quite difficult sometimes to get work experience. For me, as I told you, I worked at Marie Curie Hospice as a volunteer which was really good and a great experience for me. Um, I think any work you can do that shows that you're a caring person, so healthcare assistants in hospitals or nursing homes, once you're old enough, um, phlebotomists, so that's the members of staff who go around and take blood in the hospital. Um, that's a really good job to have. Um, one that shows off your communication skills. So I don't know, maybe seeing if there was a job in a local pharmacy, maybe to to learn a little bit about being a front facing job where you're caring for people. And I was asking my colleagues today um, about work experience. We don't often have people in for work experience. Um, we agreed within our practice that we would um, take some school students if they lived um, in the area that our practice uh, belongs to, but we've not had too many people be in touch. But if you lived in an area where there was GP practices close by, it might be an idea just to send a letter in once you were old enough to say that you were looking for experience. Um, we recently did our flu vaccinations in the surgery which all had to be a little bit different because of COVID. So we had three school students come and help us with directing the patients and telling them to put their masks on, wash their hands with the alcohol hand gel and be ready to get their flu vaccination. And it worked really, really well and they really enjoyed it. And we played them, so it wasn't a volunteer uh, situation. So yeah, that's something that you can maybe think about doing. Um, next question. Is it hard to get over a patient's death? Um, so this is a really difficult one to answer. Um, if you were doing a job like mine and you became very, very upset every time a patient died, it would be hard to sustain that. Um, so I do a lot of palliative care. So I look after people at the end of life and I care about each and every one of them. I do get involved in their family situation. I get to know them all. But with experience, I think that you still really care, but you have to compartmentalize. So you need to kind of put that in a wee box in your brain to deal with because you can't possibly, um, you know, physically and mentally manage to um, grieve every person um, that you look after who passes away. Um, I would say, though, that there's sometimes patients who really just ring a bell with you or who are maybe similar to a situation you've had in your family. Or certainly for me, if I've looked after patients who have children um, or who are similar age to me, then that that really brings it back home. But again, 
uh, if these things happen, I talk to colleagues about it. I share that, you know, I may be finding it a wee bit more hard. Um, yeah, I think talking about it and getting support is a good idea if you recognise that you're becoming upset. But it's something that you learn and you have lots of experience when you're working in the hospitals when you first become a doctor. So you'll learn from the best people who work in there. So the next question is, should young people go into university, into medicine? So uh, from my story, you can see that I did a degree before I did medicine. So I think that that's great. Um, I do think going in as a mature student was great for me. But lots of my friends went straight from school. And yeah, it's a big step up from um, your sixth year at school or your fifth year. But, you know, they all manage. They're all really successful and they work really, really hard and have great jobs and help a lot of people. So I think there's much to be said about both. Um, I would say it's a long, long career. And so if you thought that you wanted a break before you started or you wanted to do traveling maybe as part of um, working, then that's maybe a good idea because, uh, yeah, as the pension age gets pushed back and back, it's a longer and longer career and it is hard going at times. Um, so, yes, young people can apply, but equally, if you miss out first time round, don't let it put you off. There are universities now that just take graduates as well. And I think by the time that you're doing medicine, there'll be a lot more of them. Um, so, yeah, whether you're straight from school or whether you're a mature student, it's a great career for both. The next question was about the daily jobs of a GP. So when I saw this, I thought I would just um, think about what I did in a day last week. So on Thursday last week, for example, I was teaching my trainees first thing. So I go into work for half past eight, um, generally grab a coffee and have my breakfast, catch up with colleagues, and then we start teaching quite soon afterwards. So my junior doctor who's working with me at the moment is getting ready to sit some exams so we did a practice session that morning and we did a tutorial we always do a walking tutorial so we get our jackets and our hats on and we go out for a walk and get some fresh air to break up the morning and um, so that was Thursday morning then lunchtime in our practice we do yoga so did yoga at lunchtime on Thursday for 45 minutes by Zoom now, um, but we used to do it face to face. And um, then Thursday afternoon, I had a surgery. So as I said in my talk, things are a little bit different now because of COVID. So I spoke to maybe 12 patients and I tried to deal with what I could in the phone. And then I brought three of those patients down to the surgery um, and saw them. So I had all that PPE on that you saw me wearing in the picture. And I cleaned the room in between each patient and I saw them face to face and took a little bit more history and examined them and made a management plan for them. So we do a little mixture of both, to be honest. Um, so that's one day, but to be honest, every day is different. So I don't work on a Monday. So Tuesday, today I was on for nursing homes. Tomorrow I'm doing a telephone surgery from home. So I stay at home and use the computer system remotely and do that. So I speak to maybe between 15 and 20 patients tomorrow morning. Thursday is always teaching in the morning and then surgery in the afternoon. And Friday I work uh, covering the local nursing homes as well. So that's the daily jobs of a GP. As well as all the things I've said, we also do lots of prescriptions, speaking to other healthcare professionals and hospitals or other community teams, speak to our district nurses, and we check letters and do any blood results that come in there as well. So it's non-stop. And the final question that I've got is um, if there are any extracurricular activities that are best to help you become a doctor. So I don't think that there necessarily are. I think um, for me, I did do a little bit of sport. I did a little bit of travel. I worked as a nanny, um, but they're not really extracurricular activities. But um, once you get into medicine, then I think it's really important, as it is for everybody, thinking about your lifestyle and, you know, trying not to burn the candle at both ends, sleeping well, eating well, doing a little bit of exercise that you enjoy. Um, doing a little bit of something you love every day, um, whether it be watching programmes or going out with friends, 
because hopefully it'll be non-COVID times by then. Um, so just keeping yourself as generally fit and healthy as what you can, I think is the best idea. So I think that I have answered all your questions. So I will hand you back now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Jude. I hope that's given you a bit of insight into what it's like to be a GP um, as one of the biggest branches of medicine that people do. Uh, our next talk is going to be from Adam, who is a consultant anaesthetist working in Glasgow. And he's going to be talking about what it's like to be a hospital doctor, a consultant. Um, so we're going to cut to his talk now. Hello there, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Chapik. I'm one of the uh, consultant anaesthetists at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Uh, and I'm just going to talk to you for the next 10, 15 minutes or so about life as a consultant. So um, you will find out lots about the sort of training progression from medical school to then foundation doctor to uh, what we'd call a registrar or a specialty trainee. Um, and then at the end of all that time, which actually from the start of medical school to becoming a consultant takes about 16 years or so, 16, even 20 years, um, you then become a consultant. But what actually is a consultant? I mean, on, on its most simple terms, a consultant is, is a specialist within the NHS. It's someone who um, is sort of leading, uh, leading their teams and leading the groups of people that they work with in a particular specialty. And they're the people that would work in a hospital uh, or a, a sort of secondary care environment. And by that, we mean primary care is general practice. So that's stuff that's going on in the community. And secondary care is stuff that's happening in hospitals or where you patients would be referred to if they have specific problems for the specialists working there. Otherwise known in this instance as consultants. So what is the life of a consultant like? Well, um, I'll run you through it. Now, this is me. Uh, this is me at work. It's, it's not the best picture in the world, uh, but actually there's not very many pictures of me in theatre doing my job as an anaesthetist. Uh, this was one of the few times that we actually had consent from all the staff and all the patients involved to take some photos in theatre. So here we are. This is a rare, rare event. This one That's me doing my job. Now, I'm not really going to talk to you too much about being a consultant anaesthetist, because actually there's probably not that much point. So if you think quite a few of you guys uh, listening to this will become doctors at some point, which is fantastic. And maybe about half of you would then become a consultant. So probably about 50 percent of people, maybe even a bit more, become general practitioners working in the community and about 50 percent or so become consultants. But of that 50 percent, very few of those will become consultant anaesthetists because there are so many other kinds of consultants you can be. So there's almost no point in me talking specifically about my job. I'd rather talk in more general terms about what consultants do. Now, here are a few pictures you can see of consultants in different roles. So here up at the top left, you can see uh, there's a consultant doing some outpatient work. So that's patients with specialist problems who are referred to their clinic. You can even see that quite a lot of this work is now being done online to avoid patients having to come into the hospital if they don't need to. So that's outpatient work. You might work in the wards. You might do ward rounds of the patients that have been admitted for either medical problems or surgical problems. You might become a radiologist, so a specialist in looking at x-rays, interpreting those films and then speaking to all the other doctors about what the problems might be from those x-rays. There's a whole range of other things you might do. You could become a, a bacteriologist, a microbiologist, a virologist, so a specialist working in the lab looking at bugs. You could become a geriatrician. So that's someone who works with the elderly and works with a big team of people to try and get the best quality of life they possibly can for the elderly. Maybe even work somewhere like this. This is the front door of the state hospital in Carstairs. So that's a really high security psychiatry hospital for some of some people with really, really difficult psychiatric problems. You might become a cardiologist working with hearts. You might work in an intensive care environment. This is a children's intensive care. You might work as a surgeon doing gallbladder surgery. This is a, a, a picture of someone having their gallbladder removed by keyhole surgery. I guess the point is there are consultants in all of these teams. There are leaders in all of those teams, but they're all doing very, very different jobs. So, again, just looking at what those specific tasks are probably doesn't really get us to the crux of what a consultant is. But maybe television can give us an idea. If we look at the consultants that we see on television programmes. So when I was growing up, my dad was a big fan of this programme called MASH. Now, that was set in a field, an army field hospital in the Korean War, which is in the 50s, I think. Um, 
and the consultants on that, they were always these sort of wise cracking, grey haired, these guys who'd been around the block, they could fix anything. Is that a great representation of what the modern consultant is? I'm not sure. Up in the top left, that's a scene from ER. So that's a programme that you can still get on catch up. But it was really popular just before I went to uh, to med school in sort of the late 90s. And here you can see Dr. Mark Green saving the day. He's the consultant, always in at the action. Again, look at everyone focusing on him. Isn't he the hero? I don't think that's what a modern day consultant is. What about this chap? This is this is House MD. He's another American doctor. Again, look at him being trailed by all of these medical students in awe of his prowess. That's that's not how this works anymore. And even in, in British drama, so things like Holby City, the consultants often appear to be these slightly austere individuals, these people who are sometimes a bit frightening, sometimes don't treat their staff very well. That's not really what we're trying to achieve. That's not what a consultant in the modern NHS is. So television's not really going to be much help to us either. What about reading? Are there things we can read that are going to tell us? Well, there's some really great books out there. There's some books uh, by this chap, Atul Gawande. He wrote a book called Being Mortal. This guy, um, another American guy called Paul Kalanithi, he wrote this book, When Breath Becomes Air. Now, these these books are fantastic at getting to the crux of what being a doctor is. What? How do we form those relationships with patients? Uh, how do we make the right decisions for patients? And sometimes the decision that's right for the patient isn't necessarily the one we'd choose for ourselves. But that's a really important thing to tease out. And often consultants are involved when those decisions are difficult. But again, they maybe don't quite get to the real heart of what a consultant is. This picture. So this is another picture from uh, from that day in theatre when we were allowed to take some photos. Now, we were working in Ghana. There was a team of us that went over there from Scotland and we worked with a lot of individuals from the local area in the capital there. A lot of doctors, a lot of nurses, a lot of surgeons there. And we were doing some fairly complicated plastic surgery. Now, in the middle of this picture, you've got a consultant surgeon. You've got one of my colleagues here, Mike Basler, a consultant anaesthetist. And you can see that they're really the centre of things. They're really there. They're making sure they're in the centre of the action. But there's a huge team of people also working really, really hard with them. And without that team, they couldn't possibly do their jobs. They couldn't possibly do the complex work. So you can sometimes think of the consultant as like the captain of the team. So it's like a football team. A football team with a great captain can still be a rubbish football team if no one else is doing their job well. But a captain who's really working well and working hard can certainly get the best out of everyone else in that team and make that team really, really function. And sometimes that's our role as the consultant. It's not necessarily to do all of the all of the technical work with our hands, but sometimes it's to lead the team to get the best out of everyone. And sometimes we need to look away from medicine even to look at what what is leadership? What what makes a good leader? Can we learn things from that? Well, here's a book that I just read recently about a guy called uh, Shackleton. Now, he was an Antarctic explorer uh, in the 1910s, and he took a big team of people to the Antarctic. And quite honestly, everything went wrong. But the one thing that didn't go wrong was that his leadership was so good, he managed to get this team of people through an Antarctic winter, living on the ice in horrendous conditions, and they all survived. And then you look at things like Apollo 13. There's obviously a famous film with Tom Hanks of that. But remember, that was a real life event. And the book of it was written by Jim Lovell. He was the captain, the commander of Apollo 13. And again, we saw through amazing leadership, both within the spaceship and at mission control on the ground and with amazing teamwork phenomenally all those astronauts survived so maybe sometimes we need to look outside medicine to see what lessons we can learn for medicine and one of the roles of the consultant i suppose is that leadership is easy when things are going well but like shackleton in the antarctic and like jim lovell in apollo 13 when things aren't going well that's when you really need some good strong leaders and i would like to think that good consultants in the nhs perform that same role now, that chap, uh, Mike Basler, who I showed you a picture of in theatre just a, a couple of slides ago, I, I learned a huge amount from him when I was a trainee in Easter. So when I was learning to become a consultant, I worked with him quite a lot. He's about 20 years older than me, so he's got 20 years more experience. And when I qualified as a consultant, he said to me, Adam, remember that you're not being paid by the hour anymore. You're being paid to make difficult decisions when those decisions need to be made and when no one else wants to make the decision. And that's a really key thing that's stuck with me. So 
I'm not simply there just to do the work from nine to five or eight till six or whatever it happens to be. I'm now there to make sure that I'm supporting the team when there are difficult decisions to be made. And if those decisions need to be made at nine in the evening and we started at eight in the morning, but the case is still running, well, we need to stick with it. So there is clearly some responsibility on the consultants to not just lead the team, but to be part of the team all the way through and to guide people through. And as I say, we're not just there to do the technical work anymore. There's a joke always going around that anaesthetist simply injects some medicine into the patient, let them go to sleep, and then we go and read the paper ourselves. Now, I'm pleased to say that's not entirely true. But as I say, the consultants aren't always the ones that are needing to do all of the work. There are many, many other people in the hospital that can do, do those jobs equally as well as us technically. But sometimes we're there to steer the work when it's really difficult. And so I'll take you to one of the cases that we did do in Ghana. Now, this is a girl who, first of all, I should say, gave us full consent to use her pictures. But she's a girl who had a facial deformity. It was from a condition called Noma, which is kind of gangrene of the face. And it basically meant she couldn't open her mouth at all. This was the most she could possibly open her mouth. And you can imagine how debilitating that is, how terrible it is to try and eat, to try and talk, how she was becoming outcast from her society. So you can see how any kind of surgery was going to be a great benefit if we could try and change some of this deformity, try and relax her jaw. Now, this gave some huge challenges from an anaesthetic point of view. To keep her safe in the operation, we needed to control her breathing. And to do that, we needed to put a tube down into the breathing pipes. And to do that, we normally open someone's mouth nice and wide. We look down and we pass the tube down. But how do we do that when we can't open someone's mouth? So what we did, here's me and Mike. We passed a flexible telescope essentially we call it a fiber optic uh, bronchoscope we passed it down her nostril because we were able to get down the nostril but not into the mouth until we could see those airways and we passed a tube over the top of that now, i'm not claiming that's the most incredible piece of anesthetics anyone's ever done but it's certainly quite risky and there's certainly things that we need to be very very careful of when we're doing that and the decision to do this kind of thing is not always an easy one so we were there as consultants to take those decisions for the team and to take responsibility of those decisions. And if there had been pro problems, to then take responsibility of managing those problems. And here's what she looked like afterwards. Now she's still really swollen. She'd had a whole day in theatre, about 15, 16 hours or so. But you can see suddenly those teeth are able to part. And even that centimetre or two centimetres could be absolutely life changing for this girl. So Although we'd had a difficult day in theatre, although we'd taken some risks and we'd done some things that are challenging, the job satisfaction after that, having known that we've really, really pushed ourselves to the limit, the job satisfaction at the end of that day was unbelievable. And so with the difficult bits of being a consultant, we also get the huge joys and the huge highs of knowing that we've really, really helped someone through some very, very difficult times. What else do we do though? So it's not just the clinical work, as I say, as a consultant, we're the leader in, in all respects, really. So we need to all have other strings to our bow. I love doing teaching. This is me sitting on the floor teaching about um, how to manage an airway and someone who's had a cardiac arrest. But remember that we're always constantly learning as well. So we're not just doing the teaching. We're also being taught. We're reading journals. We're going to meetings. We're going on courses. And one of the joys of medicine is that just because you're a consultant doesn't mean you know everything. And what I knew as a consultant on my first day as a consultant might be very, very different to what I'll know on the day before I retire. We're constantly learning. And that's one of the great joys of the career. So you might be someone who ends up doing lots of management and you're running departments and you're running the health service. A lot of that's being done on Zoom now, but maybe we were sitting around boardrooms a year ago. And again, that's a huge challenge and it's something that's really enjoyable. You might spend your days looking at spreadsheets, looking at numbers and doing research. We don't all do a bit of everything, but we all have to have some other string to our bow. It's not just good enough to turn up to work, do the clinical stuff and then go home again. If we're going to be leaders within the health service, we need to be leading all parts of it. And remember that the e email inbox is always full as a consultant. There's always communication going on, whether it's about patients or whether it's about teaching or management or research, or all those other things. There's always emailing to be done that inbox is never looking too, too small, I can promise you. Now, I've been speaking lots about the, uh, the really high points of being a consultant, and there are lots of them, and there are lots of positives. But remember that if you're going to be the leader of the team, if you're going to be there taking the, the highs, 
You also have to be there with the lows if things go wrong and you have to be prepared to take responsibility for your whole team when there are problems. This is a picture of the High Court in Glasgow. I'm pleased to say I've never had to be there, but through everyone's career, there is a chance that they may have to go and give evidence in court at some point. And if, as I say, if we're going to take responsibility for the good things, we as consultants also have to know that it's our neck on the line sometimes and we have to take responsibility where there's problems. And I think anyone entering the career, entering the profession, has to realise that for all the benefits of medicine, there are also stresses that come with it. And that's certainly one of them. So that's us, really. So here we are back in theatre. Now, the reason why I've ended on this picture is, as I say, when I was training to be a, a, an anaesthetist, a consultant, I worked a lot with Mike. So I was his trainee. I was, in a sense, his apprentice. And the night before we did this difficult case in Ghana, we had a really good chat in the hotel and we were trying to decide exactly how we were going to do this case. And there were a few options of how we were going to keep her safe and manage her airway through this case. Now, the real leadership there was not in me manipulating this wee telescope. It was actually in Mike who ultimately said, Adam, if that's the way you want to do it, that's the way we'll go with it. So the leadership is in trusting your team, allowing them to run with their ideas, but also in being that reassurance, knowing that ultimately you're there to back them up if there's problems. And that, whether it's in theatre, whether it's in clinic, whether it's on the wards, whether it's in the labs, as a consultant, that's your ultimate role, is to know that you're there supporting your team and being the ultimate backup if, if you need to be. So there we go. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed that. It's a whistle-stop tour to what being a consultant means to me. Clearly, as I say, there's loads of different roles you can take on, but it is hugely challenging, but with the huge challenges, hugely enjoyable. So thank you very much. Good luck. And we hope to see you in the hospitals sometime soon. Cheers. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Sorry that we kind of ended up cutting to, uh, to me yapping away live. You join me in the same room. Uh, I'm a bit far away from the camera, but it's because if I move my chair, I'll currently run over my dog's foot who's sitting down there. Um, so apologies for that, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Now, we have had a few questions on the chat, um, so I'll just answer those while, while I'm here. Uh, the first one is, which area, well, how did I decide which area of medicine to go into? So when I went to med school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think that's the most common thing, or certainly a lot of people, because of things they've seen on TV, they might imagine they want to work in the emergency department or A&E or become a surgeon, because they're the things that tend to get put on telly. But as you go through medical school, you realize that there's plenty of other disciplines in medicine. There's obviously general practice that we've heard about, and there's all these other hospital specialties. And I just spent a couple of weeks doing anaesthetics as, I think, a fourth year at medical school. And I just loved it. I absolutely love that we have lots of technical aspects to it. We're doing difficult injections. We're doing, uh, doing procedures like those airway procedures that I was discussing. But I also love that there's a lot of problem solving in it, like that, uh, that patient that I was discussing earlier. You know, we really do sometimes have to sit down and think, how are we going to get patients through this surgical journey safely? So that kind of, that led me into that career. Now, we also get involved in a lot of resuscitation work, um, in intensive care work often. And although that's challenging and it can be quite stressful, it's hugely rewarding. And if I'm perfectly honest, you get quite an adrenaline kick from it. If you get called down to, say, a trauma call, someone who's had a bad car accident, and you're part of that team working to keep them safe, that's incredibly challenging, incredibly rewarding, but it's also quite good fun. So that's how I ended up doing anaesthetics. Um, how do you get over a bad case? It's really difficult, uh, is the honest answer. As Jude mentioned, in general practice, you, you learn coping strategies. You need to be able to get away from medicine. You need to have other, other hobbies, other strings to your bow. And as you get more experienced, you do learn to detach from things. And I think you learn to, dis, uh, to distance a little bit between when you felt that an outcome, a bad outcome was inevitable, when everyone tried their best and there was nothing you could do. And those are, you know, they're not great days at work, but, but you can live with those. I think the days at work that are really hard to live with are the ones where you feel there's been a mistake made. Now, whether that's a personal mistake, or whether it's just within the team, we're all human. Uh, any procedure does have downsides and sometimes those downsides show up. So we've all seen, seen problems happen. And that can, that can stay with you for a while. Uh, I think, as I say, time just gets you, gets you through these things, finding your own coping mechanisms. 
And there clearly are some cases that will really stick with you. Exactly like Jude said, some things that maybe will just ring a bell with something that's happened in your family or with close friends or, or that kind of thing will, will really linger about. Most things, just through experience, you get used to dealing with, uh, with the difficult days. But they, they remain difficult days. Um, what I would say is that my good days out, outweigh my bad days, uh, but those bad days still come. Uh, what's the most competitive specialty? It's a little bit hard to say. Um, there are certain specialties where they probably just don't need that many people in that specialty. So, uh, you know, take, for example, people who want to work in the pediatric intensive care units or the children's intensive care. Now, thankfully, not that many children become so unwell that they need intensive care. So that means you don't actually need that many doctors working in the children's intensive care unit. So those kinds of specialties tend not to have very many jobs available which means they're quite hard to get into in the first place. But in truth, there's normally a bit of a balancing of um, how many jobs, how many people they need filling those roles and how many people want to go into those roles. So all these specialties are challenging um, and, and certainly general practice is also challenging to get into and there's, there's a number of fields, um, you know, number of exams and number of hurdles that people need to go through. And certainly if you want to work in, um, in certain areas, it can be difficult in those fields as well. So I wouldn't say there's one thing that's, ultra hard to get into and I wouldn't say there's one thing that's ultra easy to get into. Most people find their own path to the career that they want to do. Remember that there's exams after university for any of these things and certainly the, the exams in anaesthetics are very, very challenging. Um, you know, I was still sitting exams into my 30s when I had a six week old baby. It, it, that's the reality of medicine and I think anyone that's going into medicine needs to be aware that that is the life that they're going into. Now, I wouldn't change my career for the world. I absolutely love my job, and I'm glad that I've gone through all those challenges to get to where I am. But there's no denying that there are lots of challenges along the way. Uh, do I have wishes for the future? Um, we've all got wishes for the future. I think someone did mention on the chat, would we like COVID to go away? Yes, we absolutely would. Would we like cures for cancer? Yes, we would. So they're the, sort of the big wishes. Um, Smaller wishes? Well, I'm not sure. I think um, the NHS is is always under stress. Um, it's always financially challenged, and I think the next few years are going to be really difficult. Clearly, a lot of money has been thrown into the NHS during the COVID crisis, but I think we're going to be meeting the challenges from that for years to come, and the fact that budgets will be tightened and tightened, I suspect. So uh, that's really sort of as my final point, is that my big wishes for the future would be to to be able to work in a healthcare system where we don't need to constantly be thinking about the budget, about the bottom line, um, where things are just a little bit easier, where there's a bit more slack in the system, where maybe there's just, just a few handful more staff would just make everything a little bit smoother running. But um, whether that's actually something that, that will come to fruition, I don't know. But is that my Christmas wish? Well, maybe it is. Uh, so... As I say, I hope you've um, I hope you've all enjoyed that, um, and I guess we'll get back to the live stream very soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, Adam. We've got one final talk for you this evening, which is about the admissions process and how to get into university to study medicine, and that is being done by Ryan, who uh, works for Reach Edinburgh. So we'll cut to his talk now. Hello, and a very warm welcome to you all. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to speak to you uh, at this event. Um, my name is Ryan Hamilton. I am a widening participation officer at the University of Edinburgh, and I run a project called Reach Edinburgh, which I'll talk to you about later on. Um, but in this session, I'm going to talk to you about applying to medical school. So you can put a face to a name. This is me on the left hand side here in much sunnier times earlier in 2020 and I'm talking to you from here on the right hand side at my home office um, in Fife. So as part of this session on applying to medicine I'm briefly going to cover Scottish and UK medical schools. I'll talk to you about the academic requirements, the non-academic requirements needed for medicine. I'll also talk about something called career exploration I'll give you a little bit more information on Reach Scotland, so the project that I run, and I'll give you some more resources and advice on what you can do just now, because you're obviously all at an early stage in your school career 
and there's some things that you might want to do just now and other things that you don't need to worry about until much later on um, in school. So first of all, let's think about the different medical schools that are in the UK. So there are 34 UK medical schools and five of these are in Scotland. And these are the University of Aberdeen, the University of Dundee, the University of Edinburgh, University of Glasgow, and finally, the University of St Andrews. So all medical schools in Scotland will ultimately qualify you to become a doctor. They all teach slightly differently. Their courses are all structured slightly differently. So these are things that you'll want to think about when you get to S5 and S6 and you're starting to think about applying to medical school. But just so you know, there are five medical schools overall in Scotland. In terms of the academic requirements, in terms of the exam results that you'll need to um, achieve in order to um, apply to medical school, um, these vary slightly, but to be quite honest, they're, they're quite very similar um, across all the medical schools, certainly in Scotland. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on SQA, National Fives, Hires and Advanced Hires. So from S4, typically medical schools are looking for a range of National Five subjects. Um, certainly at the University of Edinburgh, and to cover yourself for, for most of the medical schools, um, biology, chemistry, English and maths are certainly good subjects that we'd recommend taking um, at National 5 level. For the other National 5s, there's nothing specifically that you need to take, but we'd recommend choosing subjects, one, that you'll enjoy, and two, that you think you'll do well at. And the reason for this is because you really want to try and do um, as well as you can in your exams, and the higher the results you get, the stronger candidate you're going to be when it comes to applying to medical school. For the National Fives, we typically look for at least a B in all of these subjects, so biology, chemistry, English uh, and maths. Looking forward to S5 then, typically S5 is the most important year when it uh, comes to requirements or exam um, requirements for medicine. And typically, medical schools are looking for at least five hires by the end of S5. You won't be at any advantage if you take more than that, but the minimum number of hires that you need to take is five. Typically, the required subjects are either biology or human biology and chemistry, and either one of maths or physics. You can take both of those if you want to. A lot of schools maybe don't have the timetable capacity to do that, but as long as you have one of either maths or physics within that mix, that's absolutely fine. Now, if you're not able to take one of these required subjects at higher in S5, don't worry. If you've been able to do the five hires um, from S5, then you can pick up the required subjects in S6. Now, the grades that are needed, they do vary. And at the moment, we typically look for four A's and a B. Um, in some cases, it's three A's and two B's. But I'm not going to touch on that too much just now because things do change year on year. So when it comes to S6 and you've been ready to apply, you should check, that the, you should check the requirements and make sure that you fulfil them. In terms of the other hires that you'll want to take in S5, you can pick any other hires that you think you'll do well in and that you're going to enjoy, because ultimately you need to try and get the grades from S5. Now, the big myth about applying to medicine is that you need to have higher English. And I want to um, nip that in the bud right now and tell you that higher English is not required for medicine. So if English isn't one of your strong subjects when you get to S5, we'd recommend that you pick a different subject that you're going to do well in. So if you're more sciencey, then you might want to stick to the sciencey subjects than just picking higher English for the hell of it. If you do want to pick it up, then you could consider picking it up in S6 if you wanted to. Moving on to S6 then. So provided that you have done as well as you need to do in S5, when you get to S6, typically you're looking to take three examinable subjects. Now that can either be two advanced hires and one new hire, or it can be three advanced hires. It really does depend um, on what your school can offer and what's best for you, and also thinking about your workload. But you don't really need to worry about that too much just now. Subjects like advanced higher biology and advanced higher chemistry are useful, but they're not required. And the reason for that is because not all schools are able to offer these subjects at advanced higher. So to spread yourself as well as possible for applying to all the medical schools in Scotland, 
three subjects is what you want to be taking um, and either two of those combinations listed on screen at the moment. In terms of non-academic requirements, there are a few things that you will want to think about. So career exploration, which I'll talk about in the next slide, the UCAT, which is the university's clinical aptitude test. There's the UCAS personal statement and also interview. So I'll talk a little bit more about these just now. Career exploration is basically a fancy word for work experience and any other type of research that you can do to inform yourself more about medicine. Work experience is good at the moment. Um, in 2020, it's been difficult to come by just because of COVID-19. Um, but in normal years, we would typically be saying um, any type of work experience or voluntary experience that covers the three Ds noted on screen. So disease, that is clinical work experience and wards, GP surgeries, for example. Disabled, we'd be working with people with additional support needs. So that can be, for example, working with young people in school who have additional support needs or organisations such as Riding for the Disabled. And disadvantaged is working with vulnerable groups. So that could be working with elderly patients in a care home um, or working in a homeless uh, volunteering at a homeless project, for example. Now, I've put a star next to work and voluntary experience, and that is because at the moment, um, medical schools are accepting online work experience as an alternative because young people can't get into clinical settings for health and safety reasons to undertake clinical work experience. So that's something to bear in mind there as well. But as I've said, career exploration covers more than just work experience. It also covers any other type of research that you can do into medicine. So that could be attending public lectures or watching over recordings of public lectures or other medicine related events. Keeping up to date with current affairs related to healthcare. So that could be COVID-19 for now, for example. And any other independent research that you can do. So that might be reading magazines or journals or any other publications related to medicine. Now this all might say, seem like a lot. And you don't need to worry about that just now, but these are things just to keep in the back of your mind if you do want to apply for medicine further down the line. And the main thing is to try and keep a log of any career exploration or work experience that you undertake, whether that's now or whether that's in two years time. Get yourself a little book and keep a note of any work experience that you do. When it comes to work experience and career exploration, the main thing that you want to think about is the kind of key skills and qualities that you observe um, in doctors or medical students or other healthcare professionals when they're undertaking their work. So some of the key skills to think about there will be compassion, empathy, their listening skills, their communication skills, and that includes written communication skills as well as verbal communication skills, ability to work as part of a team, and good leaders. So these are the kind of things that you want to think about in terms of um, observations from work experience or career exploration. Another part of the application process is called the UCAT. And I want to say right now that you do not need to worry about this at all uh, at the moment, but it's just something to be aware of. So UCAT is the university's clinical aptitude test, and it's used as part of the admission selection process for many medical schools across the UK, certainly used for all the medical schools in Scotland. You'd normally set this the summer before S6 or the summer before applying to medical school. Um, so usually between S5 and S6 for most people. But if you take a gap year, that might be slightly different. It's made up of the five sections that are shown on screen and they all test different things. And the UCAT test, there is a cost associated with it, but there are bursaries which you may be entitled to to cover the cost of the test. And you can think about that closer to um, the time when you're in S5, S6 and thinking about applying to medicine. The next thing I want to talk about is the personal statement and interview. So UCAS is the University and Colleges Admission Service. It's the service that you'll apply to university through. And part of that application process is something called a personal statement. And it's basically a supporting letter. And that's something that you'll find out a lot more about when you get to that stage in school. The one key thing to remember is that when you apply to medicine, the deadline to apply is slightly earlier than other courses. And that deadline is usually the 15th of October, the year before you intend to start. So students, for example, who are looking to start 
uh, Medical School. Next year, in September 2021, they'll have submitted their UCAS applications to medical schools by the 15th of October this year in 2020. Another part of the application process for medical school is interview. So all medical schools in the UK, certainly all the medical schools in Scotland, do interview. So these might be things known as multiple mini interviews. So it's lots of different smaller interviews. It might be panel interviews, or it might be a mixture of things at an assessment day, which is what the University of Edinburgh uses. And basically, through the personal statement and the interview process, um, selectors for medical schools are really looking to see a demonstration of your commitment to medicine, any research that you've done, and to see that you have the, the start of the relevant personal attributes to pursue a career in medicine. Now, I'm just going to briefly touch on alternative routes, because in some cases there are alternative routes into medicine. So, for example, if you don't get the grades that you need, um, from S5 or S6, there are some alternative routes that you can consider. So students who are from a widening access background, so um, that varies between university to university. Um, and if you're a widening access student and you're slightly below the, the academic requirements needed for medicine, um, you might be considered for uh, either a gateway to medicine programme or a Glasgow, the Glasgow access programme. So gateway to medicine, is a, a kind of pre-entry course that runs at Aberdeen, Dundee and St Andrews, which will eventually lead you on to the standard medicine course. And likewise, the Glasgow Access Programme is very much the same thing. The other route that you can consider, uh, that you can consider, sorry, and for anyone, regardless of whether you're a widening access student or not, is graduate entry medicine. And that is where you'd go to university and you do another degree first. So that could be something like medical science, it could be chemistry or biology. And once you finish that degree, you could then apply as a graduate to a medicine degree. So that's something that you might want to think about further down the line. So that's basically everything I want to talk to you about, a brief whistle stop tour of applying to medical school. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about REACH, the project that I run. So REACH is a national widening participation project and it runs at all five medical schools in Scotland. So Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh, Glasgow and St Andrews. It's funded by the Scottish Funding Council, which is um, a branch of the Scottish Government. So it's a government funded project. And the REACH project works with eligible S4 to S6 state school pupils from across Scotland. Now, some of you will probably be too early on in your school career to think about this just now. But when you get to S4, it's something you can certainly look into. So I'd recommend that you check with your local REACH provider um, just to check the eligibility criteria when you get to that stage. And I'll give some details at the end of the presentation for you to find more information. The things that we do, we help with career exploration. So we run a number of on-campus events or at the moment online events. Um, we give information about public lectures. And we also give advice about um, work experience. The other thing that we do is we give um, um, advice, guidance, and a bit of help when it comes to applications. So that could be things like course choices, it can be UCAT workshops, personal statement guidance, and interview workshops. And again, this is all stuff that you don't really need to worry about too much just now, um, but that might be useful for you when you get to that stage of applying to medicine. So in terms of things that you can start doing now, I'd recommend that you keep studying hard, um, do as well as you can do in your exams, Use the time that you've got just now to think about whether medicine is for you or not. Um, it's absolutely fine if medicine's not for you. Coming to events like this is a great way to find out whether it is or isn't for you, because it is a, a long career that requires a lot of commitment and dedication. So it's better for you to make sure that you're making the right choice by doing all this research. Keep your guidance teachers informed. Um, and the reason for that is because there are other things that you need to think about uh, when it comes to applying to medicine. So it's good for your guidance teachers to know that and to help support you through that process. If you're eligible when you get to S4, S5 or S6, then you can consider signing up to REACH if you're eligible and make the most of any online resources that you can at the moment when you're not really able to go out and do much in terms of work experience or attend other physical events. So on the screen at the moment, I've put the email addresses for the relevant REACH partners. So depending on where you are watching this talk from um, across Scotland, um, you'll be wanting to apply to or um, get in contact with your local REACH provider if you're 
uh, in S4, S5 or S6. Or you can alternatively search for your local breach, breach provider online and find more information there. I've also put a list of some resources up here that you can use yourself at the moment. So the Medical Schools Council is the organisation that oversees all the medical schools in the UK. They have a lot of good resources for teachers and for students and also for parents on there. So you can have a little look on there. The General Medical Council's Good Medical Practice. That is the document that outlines um, how a, a professional doctor should uh, work. It will give you a good understanding of the kind of skills and qualities and duties that a doctor will undertake. And finally, the Brighton and Sussex Medical School and Observe GP are both two types of virtual work experience. I wouldn't recommend undertaking them too early. I'd potentially wait until you get to S4 or S5 until you do that. But if you're really keen, then these are two things that you can do at the moment. So thank you very much for your time. I'm sure we'll have time for some questions. Um, but thank you very much for listening. And I hope you found this talk useful. Hi everybody, um, hopefully that was useful for you and you've taken a lot of information away from that. There's a lot of information in there, but the main thing I want to say to you all right now is that there's not a lot of stuff that you need to worry about in particular. Um, the main thing is at the moment to think about your S3, S4 subjects um, and your National 5s. And once you get to S5 and S6, that's when you can really start thinking um, about the um, the, the subjects that you want to do higher and also your work experience. So um, I'm going to just wait and see if we've got any questions that come through the chat here because I can't see any questions that have come through for me at the moment. Um, but hopefully you have a better idea of the application process. It is possible for everybody. It might seem daunting at the moment. Um, but the main thing I want to say is um, if you're really interested in pursuing a career in medicine, coming to events like this tonight are absolutely brilliant um, to get more information. And if medicine turns out not to be for you, then that's also not a bad thing. Um, as you've heard from all the speakers tonight, uh, medicine is a, a long career and um, takes a lot of dedication, a lot of commitment. Um, so doing things like this, attending events like this, really will be able to help you um, figure out whether medicine um, is for you or not. Um, so in terms of admissions, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to cover. Um, so any advice um, for if things don't work out or don't go the way that you wanted? So the first thing I will say there is there are alternative routes into medicine. So as I said, you can think about going to university first and studying for another degree. And I see a lot of people in the chat earlier on were asking about, you know, do I need to have a chemistry degree to study medicine? You don't need to have a chemistry degree to study medicine necessarily. But if you don't go to medicine straight from school, you can go and study chemistry first and then consider applying as a graduate for medicine. Now, another question that's come up is how old do you have to be um, to get work experience? Um, that tends to vary by NHS um, board. Typically, you need to be over 16 in, in most cases. Um, and at the moment, you might struggle to get any physical work experience um, just now. But as I sh uh, showed on my presentation there, there are a few online alternatives that you can use um, in order to get work experience at the moment. And I've already touched on the next question, which is what other degrees can you do to become a doctor? So really, there are, any type of science degree is going to set you up in good stead. Um, things like medical science, biomedical science, chemistry, biology, these types of degrees are the, are the ones that you'd really look to go for um, if you're thinking about going down the graduate route. Um, and there's another course, are you able to do more than one course in uni, um, for example, um, medicine and Italian. Um, some places you can potentially do that. Um, and within the medicine degree, um, you know, you can intercalate, which you've already heard about, which is when you take a year out halfway through your medicine degree to, to sit to take another degree. So that's another possible option that you can consider in terms of taking um, other, other courses alongside medicine. And finally, one of the last questions is, do you get the chance to study abroad in medicine? Um, in some cases, you can take an elective um, placement. 
and you can apply to go abroad if you want to. Um, but not just that, um, in the summer between different years, you can also go away and work abroad. You can get work experience. You can also do voluntary work. So these are all things that are um, really useful for you to do um, personally and both for, for your career there as well. So I'm just really aware of the time and I know that we've had you here for quite a while. Um, so thank you very much for listening and I hope that you found my talk useful and that you found the rest of the talks useful. And I'm just going to pass back to the You Can Be A Doctor team for the final part to wrap up. Thank you for that, Ryan. And uh, that's us to the end of our talks for the night. Um, I hope you found these talks useful uh, and you've learned a bit about both medical school, getting into medical school and also what it's like to be a doctor. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers for uh, coming out here and speaking tonight. Uh, apologies again for the issues we've had with chat and with some of the technical issues. Uh, it's been a very different year this year for running these events. so. We're still finding the best way to do things. If people have further questions, I want to direct you to, again, the email address advice at youcanbeadoctor.co.uk. This email address is manned by medical students and doctors who are always happy to answer any questions you've got about medicine and about the process of applying for medicine. I'd also encourage you to have a look at the website, youcanbeadoctor.co.uk where we have lots of resources pulled and lots of information about medicine and how to apply for it. Uh, other than that, I think, as I say, I'd just like again to thank all of our speakers and all the people behind the scenes who've been trying to run the tech and things. Um, and thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay, bye.